get your paychecks up to two days faster with early pay. True story. Welcome to Huntington. I'm Alan Lingle, and welcome to Deadline TV. My guest today is a friend and former colleague at the Washington Post, Martin Weil, the reporter, editor, and rewrite guy. And we're going to be talking about Watergate. Marty has been at the Post and is still there, and he had gotten to the Post before Watergate. And tell me, Marty, you were one of the first names on the Watergate story. Tell us uh, what, what was happening. Well, here's what happened. I, I'm going to tell you that there is a story. In those days, you didn't have 24-hour news cycles or whatever they call them these days. And very few people knew anything about Watergate until the day after the break-in when it appeared on the front page of the Sunday Washington Post. And it was a very long and very thorough excellent story, and it carried one byline. That was of our legendary police reporter, Alfred E. Lewis. Uh -huh. And among his accomplishments that day was being inside the Watergate with the police after the arrests were made and the police were poking around. Well, he got in there. And the famous story is, I don't know if it's in Woodward and Bernstein's book, but the famous story is, now you know, this is a slight digression, but I yeah. thought you wouldn't mind. It's all about journalism. Right. Reporters are not allowed to misrepresent themselves. But Al knew lots of cops, and the cops were in there, and he walked in the lobby, and he went up the elevator and into the, into the headquarters. And eventually a couple of detectives looked around and said, where are you from? And you know, you can't misrepresent yourself. He said... I'm from downtown. <laughs> I <love it. laughs> and, I love that. and he probably had on that blue sweater that he would always wear, a blue cardigan sweater, such as police probably still wear in all sorts of TV shows back in the station house. When it gets a little chilly, you wear your blue cardigan sweater. So he was up there. And therefore, for that alone, he deserved the byline on the front page. You get back to that part of the story. But now you also contributed. You, you're yes. Name, well, you're, let me explain so, to you how, sure, it, how sure. it came about that I was sure. contributing. You know, the question is, and it's not really readily answered, who first heard about the break-in and how did they hear? This is something that I've told once or twice in the newsroom, but it certainly isn't widely known among members of the public. But I thought, before I thought I would go on your show, I said, you know, I can tell that story. It's one of my favorite stories because you did mention that I'm an editor. And on the night of June 16th, the 16th of June, which was a Friday, we usually probably had three people on the night desk and they all went home except for me. I was left on the night desk. And people who are familiar with, with reporting and newsrooms know that many of them have what they call a police scanner. You're familiar with a police <laughs> scanner. Isn't that right? That's well, correct. in, in yes. those days, we had a police scanner on the desk, on, on the literal desk, on the city desk. And I would sit there and do whatever I might do at that hour of the morning. But people know you become able to do what you're doing and at the same time, you can hear the police scanner. Now, this is, sounds like a true shaggy dog story. So I must get to the point immediately. Sometime that morning, Sometime that morning, the morning of the 17th, that fateful day, Saturday, the 17th of June, I heard this on the police radio. It said, doors open at the Watergate. Now, who knows what anything like that means? Right. Doors open at the Watergate. Right. So I listened to it, and I heard it, and I thought about what it might mean. And then about 10 or 15 minutes later, I heard that again, it said, doors open at the Watergate. And that was all I heard, but 
I sensed that that was probably significant. And because I was there at that hour, we had a reporter available to me. I was an editor and there was a reporter there. I had no idea what those words meant, except it was something that got the attention of the police. Uh, and what time was it at? No. This was at about 1 a.m. on 1 Saturday. Uh, and that was, as far as I am concerned, the very first indication that came to anybody in the media that something was afoot at the Watergate. Now, you know, the Watergate is a big complex. There are apartment houses. There is that office building. There is a hotel. Didn't say which, just said doors open at the Watergate. So the inference is that something that should have been locked was actually open and someone had called the police and was dispatching some officers to see what that meant. And I looked around in the newsroom. It was largely empty at 1.30 on a Saturday morning and a June morning. And I had one intern who was <laughs> some yards away in the newsroom. And I said, I could send him down to the Watergate to find <laughs> out what is going on. Uh -huh. But you know, I know how I know how things work. It's a big building. Some cops would arrive, they would park their cars, they would go into the building, and he would be standing outside, and he would be there for hours on end on a very hot, humid Saturday morning in Washington, DC. And it was unlikely that the police were going to tell this young fellow what they had found at the Watergate. And I would have to remain there. I couldn't just tell him, you go down there to the Watergate. I'm going home. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So I would be there for hours until he was probably told by the police, actually, it's none of your business. <laughs> So that. that's how we missed the Watergate story. And I was always a little bit uncertain. Always means for hours that morning. Other things, other things attracted my attention. And I didn't think too much more about that police call, that those two police calls that merely said doors open at the Watergate. And it sounds like later, the name of a book. That's right. It could be a book. It could be a book. But the great story that I recall is coming into the newsroom for my next shift late on the very same Saturday. It was late in the afternoon. And the typical greeting, you meet your colleagues at the city desk and you typically say to them, hi, anything up? Here I am, anything up? <laughs> and usually <laughs> they say, oh, you know, nothing usual. They say, yes. There's been a break-in at Democratic headquarters at the Watergate. <laughs> oh, my and God. And in a very low voice so that nobody could hear but me. And I didn't think it was going to help my career any. So I said it in a low voice. I said, oh, so that's what that was. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, mystery, mysteries are cleared up. And... For me, that was the big mystery of that day, and it was cleared up. But we didn't have too many people who were scheduled regularly to work in the newsroom on a Saturday, you know, because it's not a day when too much news breaks or is made. But I was scheduled, I think, that day to be a reporter and not an editor. However, everybody who was in the newsroom was assigned calls to make. And I was assigned a variety of calls to make in connection with the uh, news about the break-in. And I had to call a, a bunch of Republican officials, just as you would do, and to ask them what they knew about this. <laughs> <laughs> and what and was their reaction? They were indignant. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So you. What do you think I know about that? burglary or something. Why are you calling me on something stupid like this? Oh, really? What kind of call is this? Where do you work anyway? <laughs> What's your boss's name? Yeah. <laughs> 
And it was hard finding their numbers because we didn't have the internet. And I managed to find their numbers and looked them up. And I said, hello, this is Martin Weil at the water at the Washington Post. You know, we've learned that there was a break in at the Democratic Party headquarters at the Watergate. Um, do you know anything? About <laughs> Where were you at one o'clock? In Where the were you at one o'clock? <laughs> uh. So that was my connection. I every once in a while I would remember some of the guys who died. They were very, they were very dignified gentlemen, and and they were party officials who had roles in supervising party activities, but. They were indignant and certainly weren't helpful and didn't contribute much to our story. So, but I made a lot of calls. I certainly was there and calling everyone who was suggested to me. And and so a story came out, it would have been on Sunday that the- That was on Saturday. I was making those calls. I was making those calls right. on Saturday evening. Uh -huh. And then the paper ran a huge story story on the front page the next day we didn't we didn't post it on the internet you know? right right pre, nobody, pre internet that's right it was long before internet we had only typewriters we wow. didn't have even the most rudimentary kind of computer we had typewriters and phone books and with that we were covering the story and and so there was a story that came out and was Al Lewis, the, uh, and Al Lewis was the author of the first he was days. The he was the, he, his name was on top of the story that ran on the front page of the next day's post. The next day was Sunday, June 18th. And for many people, there aren't many sources of news for many people. That was their first indication that, this story had occurred that a big story big was story. breaking in Washington. It and wasn't even a contributor with, yes, with, with Bob, Bob Woodward, and Carl, Bob Bernstein. Woodward and Carl Bernstein, who did a great deal of the work that day, because you know, what happened is editors of the post, this is relatively common knowledge, but not everybody knows it. Mostly people who are into journalism and into Watergate. What happens is the break-in was at Democratic headquarters. And the Democratic Party was represented by a law firm that also represented, guess who? The yes, Washington. the Washington Post. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there were, there were this law firm, the famous law firm of Williams and Connolly. Connolly, yes, yes. I had many, many encounters with them <laughs> over the years. Many, many. Yeah. Yes. Over the anthrax case. Trying, <laughs> I was over their offices many times. Well, good. That only confirms, that only confirms yeah. the likelihood that this yeah. is how the Post officially, except for that one reporter who heard uh -huh. doors open at the Watergate, the Post officially learned of the break-in because the Democratic Party rented the premises. The Democratic Party learned of the break-in. Their lawyers learned of the break-in. And their lawyers also represented the Washington Post. So early on that morning, Howard Simons, who was then the managing editor under Ben Bradley, who was the executive editor then, Howard Simons was called by one of the lawyers and said, hmm, there's something that you guys might be interested in. So they had been working on that story for hours by the time I came in and they were right in the middle of pursuing it. And so when I came in and asked him that desultory casual way, ah, oh, anything up? Yes, this better break in. And they were all over it. They had already had that court proceeding where Woodward had keenly heard the, the, uh, the one of the burglars tell the judge who was conducting the arraignment or the presentment in court of the burglars who had just been arrested. He said, well, you know, we, we need to tell you something, Your Honor. There's something you need to know here. He says, this isn't, we're in the CIA. I'm in the CIA. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, he didn't get too close to the bench and Woodward was sitting up front and he heard very clearly. And this guy who was in the break-in said he's in the, he's in the CIA. Wow. <laughs> he hit, hit, hit pay dirt there. Yes. So, so that got everybody started very quickly. And then I can tell you another good story about 
about Watergate and the personalities involved. You know, people, depending on how closely they follow it, they know hardly the names of the burglars, but there were two people whose names that they connect very often with the break-in if they're well-informed. One was Howard Hunt and one was G. Gordon Liddy. I don't know if you recall yourself oh, the name absolutely. of G. Gordon yeah. Liddy. Oh, uh, he was one of the supervisors of the break-in and he was behind the plumbers, that organization that that had been set up for the Nixon administration to, to uh, deal with matters that were felt to be of important national security interest. And he was involved with this Watergate break-in. But as, as I recall it, the very first time his name appeared in print in the Post was in a story I had written and when I was sent to cover an NRA convention in Washington, and this was before the break-in, and they, they had a bunch of speakers at this convention, and Gordon Liddy may have appeared in Jack Anderson's column. His name may have appeared there. But at the time, he, was, uh, he had been a prosecutor in upstate New York in one of the counties above above New York City. He was uh, very interested in guns and was invited to speak at the NRA convention because he was an assistant to a, an undersecretary of the treasury, an undersecretary of the treasury for law enforcement. And Liddy had been given to this undersecretary as his special assistant. I don't think the undersecretary had recruited him, but they said, here, take Gordon Liddy, he's your assistant. And he got up at this NRA convention, and he was, he, I didn't know who he was, but he made a memorable presentation, and he eventually found his way into my story on this NRA convention. He said, I'm really glad to be here with people who care about guns. And, you know, I could have gone to one of them brunches at Georgetown, but this is, these are my kind of people. I don't hang out with these people in George. I go, whoa, this is great. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah, I woke up, you know, I was, I was sitting there dozing because it wasn't that exciting. Right, and as right. other things said, and, you know, people wanted to get laws passed that would have taken away your your pistols, but that didn't happen. <laughs> and, he, he, and then later on in the newsroom, so I wrote this up, I was sort of sleepy, but I said, you know, this, this sounds pretty interesting. And I, I put this into my, put this into two paragraphs of my roundup story and all the speeches at the NRA convention. And I thought very little of it, but later in the newsroom, you could hear talk and they were trying to trace how Liddy got into the White House. And one, one school of thought was that when the tre Treasury Undersecretary read in the Post what he had said about, <laughs> about gun control, he said, I got to get rid of this guy. And the White House had to take him on. And I was sort of a little bit, a little bit uneasy about that because, you know, there was... There was no text that I could find, and it was just my quote. And I thought maybe it was my story that had started the water. I didn't tell anybody in the newsroom about it, but I was sort of unhappy. But years later, I found in an NRA magazine they had the proceedings of the of that convention. Oh, really? And wow. sure enough, that he said just what I said. And in addition, I had heard in the newsroom that theory about how Liddy got assigned to the White House wasn't true. It, was, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't because of my story. But, you know, it could have been. Right. right. <laughs> well, let me ask you, how, how did, uh, how, you know, Woodward, Bernstein, uh, they, were, they were pretty young back then. They yes, were all yes. very young. Well, they then. were all on Metro. Metro was covering the story. It was a Metro story because it was basically a local crime. Here's this office building in the district. It didn't happen to be on K Street. The tenants happened to be 
the Democratic National Committee, but it was just an office building. And this was a burglary. You know, it was a burglary. And the national desk doesn't really cover burglaries. This isn't... Right. That's this below isn't national. Well, it isn't the kind of thing they cover. Right. And in fact, you know, I'm going to digress again. Remind me of, to get into this burglary again, because there was a man who was famous for calling it, I don't a third rate burglary. And he's, when they would ask him, he was Nixon's press secretary. Right. And they would ask him, what, what's going on here? What is, what is the president doing? You know, why, what about all this scandal we're reading about this? This is nothing but a third rate burglary and you guys are barking up the wrong tree. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a while, but you asked why they were working on it. Yeah, well, how did they, and, and, and tell me their reputation back then. They were, well, they were really new. They had young. two kinds of reputation. You know, Woodward was a very upright, careful, organized individual. And Carl was the cor more of the, uh, more of the rapscallion type of person that you would expect to find in a newsroom especially you would find it if you were a person who knew about journalism based on the front page and other movies of the 30s and 40s. Right. Carl was a guy who, who had started work at the Washington Star before he even finished college. And he was just interested in newspapers and journalism. And he was in the newsroom that day because his editor, he was a Virginia reporter covering Virginia politics. And the famous story about him, it's probably partly true and partly legend, is that he rented a car to go to Richmond, the headquarter, the capital of Virginia, to cover politics there. And then he drove back to Washington and he, he wrote a story, but he never returned the car. The car <laughs> went... <laughs> <laughs> the car was parked possibly in the post parking lot, just running up the bill. <laughs> uh, I love it. And and he was there on this Saturday, and to use a, a big word, a four or five syllable word, he was there sort of adventitiously. He was there because he didn't always get stories in on deadline, and he was there to get that story done even if you had to come in on a Saturday. So he was there and his editor was there too. They were gonna to work together in getting that story done. But then obviously the story broke and Woodward was, Woodward was probably, he might've been assigned to work that Saturday, but Barry Sussman, who was the city editor, knew that Woodward was probably the most aggressive reliable, resourceful reporter, even despite his relative youth. Now, he, he was a young fellow, but, but he'd been four years in the Navy. He'd gone to Yale, and he was a, an upright, reliable person. And he was the one who was sent to court when they knew that these people were going to be into court. Barry Sussman, who was the city editor that day and whom who you might know had just died in a, this month, just a oh, few really? days before the anniversary to Watergate. So Barry sent Bob Woodward there. And I can tell you this great story about Bob Woodward because in the old, old days of the Post, before we worked in the newsroom, we worked in a different newsroom, the ones with steel desks, all typewriters. By the time you came, we had computers, no typewriters. But Bob really wanted to work in journalism. And there's a famous story of how he sat on Harry Rosenfeld's curb. He was aggressive and resourceful. He wanted to, he wanted to try out at the post. And in those days, even though I think it was against union regulations, there were strict union rules. Once a person came in and went to work at the post, it wasn't a tryout. They they were on probation for six months. You didn't have a one day or a ten day tryout. But on the they did things a little bit loosely then in those yeah. days. And people would come in for ten day tryouts. And there was a desk next to me where I, I sat in the old newsroom, 
it was the old, old newsroom. Mm -hmm. There was a desk next to me and people would show up at that desk, sort of strangers <laughs> for, their, for, for their 10 day tryout. Yeah. And one of the guys who showed up for this 10 day tryout was Bob Woodward. And he was such, he was such a demon and so filled with energy is he was never there to sit next to me. He would come in occasionally and put his coat down and then he'd be out and grab a notebook and he would be out on the street again, interviewing everybody. But he was there for a 10 day tryout and he did well enough on this tryout. I don't think they could run stories from people who were on 10 day tryouts. I think the union wouldn't have been happy about that but they had 10 day tryouts nevertheless. They got him a job at the Montgomery County Sentinel. It was a local paper. And of course he was so good there that he soon became a reporter at the Post. And there were a couple of stories I have in connection with Bob before Watergate. These were before Watergate. One of the things he did looking for stories, scrambling and scrapping for stories for something that hadn't been covered, for something he could get his teeth in. That sounds like a kind of pun, something he'd get his teeth in. He would, <laughs> he went to the city's Department of Health and they would close restaurants right and left, but nobody ever knew about it because nobody ever covered. It wasn't a beat on the Metro staff or on the city staff. It wasn't the beat, the Department of Health. He started covering it. He said, this famous restaurant and that, he would write stories, this and that famous restaurant has been shut down by the Department of Health because the kitchen is filthy. Wow. And that's a terrific story. Oh and yeah, he people love that. He, he, just, he just recognized that as a story and started and dug into it and was really making a splash and making a name for himself. He wasn't a nobody when he was assigned to cover the first day of the Watergate. But when he would be the post that believes in fairness and he would get these reports from the Board of Health saying some of the big hotels, this hotel kitchen has been shut down because the kitchen is filthy. Here's a report by a, a city official said there's mouse droppings, <clears throat> there's this and there's that. And I would come in late in the afternoon and I'd say, anything doing? I'd say, yeah, we need you to go over to the kitchen of the, this hotel. It's been shut down and they want to talk to somebody from the post and show us that it's really clean. And so I, <laughs> so Did you I get to go through the kitchen and grab a French yeah, fry or something? No, they, they didn't give me anything to eat. And they would say, look, look at this spotless. And I said, looks good to me. <laughs> after, after a while. So that's how I became an early contributor to Bob Woodward's groundbreaking work because wow, I would wow. come back and I would say interviewed late so late in the afternoon in his kitchen so and so so and so said we have cleaned this place up it is spotless now I, now as time yeah. went on as time went on suddenly the, the the story seemed to pick up Did, was there was there a sense how how early on was there a sense that this is going to be historic this is going to be monumental not only to the country, but to the Washington Post. When, when well, it took a long time. It was like one of those big, heavy airplanes, like Howard Hughes's airplane that took a long time fl uh, running, going down the estuary in Long Beach. They wanted to see if it could get off the ground. And it took a long, long runway for this story to get big. And eventually it did, but it probably it took about a year and it, required intervention. You know, the idea is those, those burglars were arrested and they started going through the court process. And Carl and Bob dug in to the evidence. They traveled around and they found, they found people who had bits and pieces of the evidence that they could show. And each little piece of the evidence would become a full-fledged story in the post the next day. And yes, it would... Yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I remember uh, during the Monica Lewinsky thing where suddenly the night that before they dropped the story, there was a big huddle of editors 
And I remember saying to my editor, Julie Mackinnon, I'm saying, hey, what's going on over there? All the editors are sticking around. And she said, oh, something about an intern at Bell Clinton. <laughs> I don't know. And, and you know, and it, was there a lot of that kind of huddling in the court well, of Ben Bradley and Howard? And, and there was a lot of that. There was a lot of that. There were always meetings. And, you know, Ben Bradley and Howard Simons had had offices with those big glass walls. So everyone could see everything that went on in the newsroom. Occasionally, Mrs. Graham might come down and we didn't know what the agenda was, but there was a lot of goings and comings and the lawyers would, would come and go. And there was a lot of discussion about what the story was and whether we were pushing it a little bit too hard. Each day, a new piece, like a canceled check, which it would be hard to make a, a front page story of a canceled check and say a canceled check has been found that was made out to so-and-so and endorsed by somebody. And then you'd have to explain for about eight or nine paragraphs, the significance to America of a canceled check. And people were starting, people really wanted to see a lot of excitement immediately and weren't, weren't as excited as you might expect about canceled checks. But Barry it- Sussman, who was a the city editor then, he knew that he had hold of a piece of string and they were pulling and pulling on it. But it, but the Republicans, as I recall, the Republicans who are high up, including the ones who knew that they didn't want us to cover it and others who had an interest in not being seen as people who had neglected and ignored a big story, that means in the newsroom, there was a little bit of working together and some of the reporters would have sources high in the government and say, now then, they would have lunch somewhere and they say, now then, what the is going on with this, this Watergate business, you know? And all you have to do is say, you know, this is, your paper is looking like really an odd outfit. They're the only ones, they got this strange story, a cancel check here, every day a Watergate story. What, what they, do they think they're doing? And the more uh, established reporters and saying, mm, "Yeah." Mm. Was, was there some doubt in in within the newsroom? Where there's oh yeah, there was there a lot of cynics who said, "Oh, that Watergate bullshit." It's like, "Oh, there's a lot God, of doubt. why are we? What are we there doing?" There was a lot here? of doubt. I think occasionally people would would meet informally the the top editors. They wouldn't run into his office and say, "What are we doing?" But they would meet them informally and say, "You know, I don't want to be the one to." To, to squelch a big story, but <laughs> there was a lot of doubt, especially because this happened in 1972. And later on in 1972, Nixon had this huge landslide right. victory. Yeah. That's important to remember because it showed the that public. Up. Yeah. That's right. The public believed in Nixon. The public was not so excited in the Washington Post George McGovern wasn't saying, well, you got to vote for me because of Watergate. <laughs> yeah, I was, was shocked by the landslide. and I mean, and with yeah. Watergate, you thought that would have an impact. And it That's had, right. It had zero, zero impact. Yeah. It was close to zero impact. And I think people were sort of a little bit demoralized then because then it was a way of saying, you know, the country, you might think this is a great story, but the country thinks otherwise. They just showed it at the ballot box. Right. Yeah, well, so how, did, there that, was how that, did that resonate in the newsroom after? It must have been the next day. Well, they were people, people were said, disappointed. Holy cow. People were disappointed. But these guys basically they kept pulling and tugging at this story, and they would they would do as they the famous watchword said in that watchword of the investigation. They would follow the money. And there were there were a lot of there were people who were conscience stricken. That counts. There were people in the administration who were conscience stricken and who could be cultivated. There were a lot of phone calls that used to go on endlessly. You know, you can't keep going to somebody's house and knock on the door. A lot of that went on, but you could call people on the phone at all hours and suggest, so what do you think about this? Did you see about that check? You know, you've collected money for the administration, but what about what about this shady seeming operation? And Carl's desk wasn't that far from mine. I would be there in, at night most of the time, and he would 
he wouldn't call these guys at their offices in the in the White House, but you could call people at home at night and he would be calling them and talking to them and saying, but what about this? But what about that? And he had a great he had great skills at persuasion and got people to talk to him as as Bob did, you know, and gradually a lot of these stories um, seem to have some substance to them. And gradually there had been that burglary. The burglary was not being swept under the rug by the United States Attorney's Office, but there was going to be a prosecution and these burglars were going to go on trial and they were going to get stiff sentences unless they could provide the court and the U.S. Attorney's Office with some information that seemed to be a reason to show cooperation on their parts. And they had to get that money and it, was, it wasn't that easy to get them the money. There was, that was part of the problem, remember? Everybody needs money, and it was easy to say, so these, there are guys, there's guys, they've been very stand-up guys, they've been silent, but you know, they need money, they got expenses, they got families. So, well, we could get that, and gradually, these people in the White House weren't the most expert. They weren't exactly mobsters, and they had bag men and so on who showed up at the hearings, and the hearings were part of the story. But there were signs that there were conversations in the White House about getting money for people who needed money to maintain their silence. And the judge was very su suspicious about what they were doing and why they were doing it and on whose behalf. And these, all of these strands of, of information began to flow together after the election. The election was a disappointing and dispiriting period. And I think people felt for a while that we had been rejected in some way, but that investigation continued and gradually, bit by bit, the investigation took shape and became more substantial. And, and was, was there a fear inside? I mean, it was, it was the Washington Post story. Was there a fear that, you know, other New York Times was getting in, CBS? Was there a fear of losing the story to another organization or, or was, was there that pressure to keep holding Well, there was always a pressure to be ahead. There was a pressure to be ahead, but there was always, I think there was the recognition that we were ahead of the rest of them. And a lot of them were only going to dare to go so far. A lot of them were going to be a little bit more conservative and cautious and willing to listen to their uh, higher level sources than we were and they were going to say what are those guys doing you know <laughs> what, what are you? i think henry kissinger himself was enlisted uh you may have heard that story and this is all in print somewhere i know i've read it but he was enlisted someone spoke to him and said you know kay graham you know why don't you save her from the error of her, of her ways henry <laughs> And he said, I will do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello, Kate. I need to yes. speak to you. <laughs> so and, and, she would and come down. Many... And yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. She would come down and ask to be reassured that there was something going on there. And yeah. Ben Bradley. He was, you know, was good at that. And they were pretty right. tight. They were, they were pretty right. tight. Let me ask you, how many, you know, everyone hears of Woodward and Bernstein. Uh, were there other re report? Were, was there a big group of reporters helping, uh, as supporting cast, or was it pretty small circle? And and was every day where people like going, "Hey, what, is there anything new for tomorrow's paper?" Or what, what was every what was day? There was there? a little bit. Every day there was a little bit. You know, they would get things. Maybe they maybe they eked them out so everything wouldn't be given in at the same day. But there were there were these checks that that had been obviously given to the people donated to a Republican organization and somehow might have found their way into a bank account and was cashed by somebody with some connection to the Republican National Committee and who was connected in some way to these plumbers. There would be connections that could be drawn and shown. There was that famous 
paper trail. <clears throat> and the prosecutors were working on it. But in the post, it was mostly Woodward and Bernstein worked on it. Pretty but much. once the hearings started, then there were the hearings. The hearings opened the, opened the story wider to other reporters in the newsroom oh, yeah, sure. because a lot of people came and testified at the Watergate hearings and they had something to say. And then there were reporters assigned to chase them, to chase the, the people who had been witnesses and to chase everyone who testified at a hearing at, at the Senate Watergate Committee's hearing. And, and were so you was, asked? To, were you asked to do anything beyond? Was there? Were there periodically times where they said, "Marty"? Yeah, from time to time. This. From time to time, I was sent places. No big story, but there would be news conferences. Maybe the FBI was holding a news conference, or or a Senate, a group of senators was holding a news conference. I remember one and some senators. It was sort of informal. It was before the Watergate investigation committee started or the, water, the Senate Watergate committee started, a bunch of senators held a news conference saying, you know, there's a lot of information here that we read about and there aren't a lot of good explanations. We think this is the kind of thing that the U.S. Senate should look into and we we would like to see it investigated. And, you know, I would I would be at news conferences of that sort. And, and let me ask you, the so once Watergate, I mean, the full impact of it when Nixon finally stepped down. Uh, what do you think happened to the status of the Washington Post? And how many more applications was everyone like, I've got to, I want to work with Woodward and Bernstein? Or what, what, was, what was the environment like that at that time? Well, it was very big. It, was, it really was. It, you know, there's that word that was used in a, a speech couple of years ago by a president and he mentioned one of the service organizations and said this is this operation is really good for your brand well <laughs> the watergate the watergate was really good for our brand uh -huh. and it was it was the book and the movie did it imagine you know imagine a movie showing what reporters could do there are always a lot of ambitious people in america and they didn't know what to go into. Maybe they would go into law. Maybe they go into medicine. They were always aggressive, ambitious people. And then a lot of people would see that movie and say, journalism, that's what we should go into. You know, you could do anything in journalism. You could be the same. You could ask, you could stand up at a news conference just like that Dan Rather did. And he said, what did he say? Are you trying to something are you trying to hide something mr rather and then and said to the president at the news conference no mr president or you and and they said wow this is great this is what we wanted to do all along <laughs> whoever knew because before that journalism was sort of a low a low paid operation for people who were sort of shabby and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and and didn't become celebrities in their own right, you know? Now, the New York Times, I mean, at that time, and I, I think still feel there was always that kind of rivalry. New York Times was clearly at a high, higher stature than the Post. Is that fair to say? At that That's time? right. And do and you feel like, I, I know there's still debates over, you know, some people say, oh, the Times is still better no matter what. Uh, but other people say, oh, the Post has really come into its own since since Watergate. Um, well, it was the Pentagon Papers a little <laughs> bit earlier. It was that and then the Watergate, which is a much bigger story. Mm -hmm. And of course, when people say it's shorthand, they say they would say Watergate, the Washington Post brought down a president, mm -hmm. you know, and nobody, nobody on the Post would say that because there was too much of a gap between what the Post wrote and the resignation of of Nixon, it, it really required the court prosecutions and the, the Senate right. hearing and a, a great deal more, but people would shorthand it and there was that movie and most people make, make uh, like the short version of a story. So there was a great vogue of investigative reporting and I think a lot of people felt that it sort of changed journalism. And even if you worked in a small town and somebody said that the sewer commissioner might be, uh, might be taking money on the side from 
one of the sewer contractors and people would they would want to jump on that story and it might lead they think it might lead, lead to the mayor and the governor and maybe the senate and and maybe it would be the front page story and maybe they would be recognized all over the country and maybe maybe the sewer commissioner really wasn't maybe he was on the up and up he was just forgetful and he he forgot to make out his expense account properly but there were all sorts of people that were investigating everything on all right. levels all over America. And partly it was thought that that was due to the Post and its success in covering Watergate. Success in the sense of getting to the bottom of the story, not in altering the government, which is not our role. Right. So before, before we wrap this up, I, I do want to ask you the one story that I remember you telling me uh, when we were working together about the Pentagon paper and you were, uh, Oh, you that were, story. That was a were, good story. Yeah. So, Go ahead. You uh, could ask about it. Well, so you, then it, yeah, it would you, lay you, the groundwork. Yeah. So you were, uh, you were asked to, to go out, uh, to a certain judge's house. one Yes. Night. Yes. Here's the, here's what happened. There's a little bit of background and I always tell it at excessive length, but at any <laughs> rate, at any rate, there were two things two competing processes going on. The Post was trying to write stories about what was in the Pentagon Papers. The government was trying to get court orders that would stop the Post from printing these stories. So finally, at one particular juncture, there was a probably a Friday night the Post had a big story on what was in the Pentagon Papers, and it was set in type for the first edition, and there had been a court hearing earlier that afternoon, maybe five o'clock, and the United States Court of Appeals basically passed on the story. They said, we are not going to reinstate this injunction, which would, if in force would stop the post from publishing the Pentagon Papers. We are not going to do that. Effectively, when the US Court of Appeals said they are not going to reinstate this injunction, that meant we could go ahead and print the print the story. But there's a there's a industrial aspect to this. If you want to print the story, you've got to go through the laborious industrial process of setting it in type. You know, there was the hot lead, you had to set it in type, right. you had to cast the, you had to make the pages into molds, you had to cast, use the molds to cast printing plates, you had to get these big heavy printing plates onto the presses. And there we were, we were going through that process late at night on a Friday night or maybe on a Saturday night with a big paper in store and we have deadlines. And when they ring that bell in the, in the press room, the presses will start to run and the trucks are lining up outside and they're going to grab the papers and drive them out to all points where they distribute them. Imagine people thought, imagine what would happen if <laughs> not satisfied with the court of appeals staying the injunction. Imagine what would happen if the administration went to the Supreme Court tonight for an emergency injunction and at 10 o'clock they showed up in the newsroom and said, stop the presses, get that story <laughs> off the presses. You can't run it. And we would be stuck, you know, you, you don't remake the front page that early and we would have nothing to show for our subscribers on Sunday morning. So to make sure that the Supreme Court had not given these people an emergency injunction, I was, the court obviously was not sitting there up on Capitol Hill at nine o'clock or 10 o'clock on Saturday night waiting for somebody to show up. So what was, we would do the kinds of things that is, are done in aggressive newsrooms. You go to the source. Who was the source? If you want to find out what the Supreme Court has done, you go to the chief justice. Well, we didn't know his phone number, 
but that didn't matter. We knew where he lived out in the suburbs in Arlington. We, we had his address. So another reporter and I were sent out there late, late on a Saturday night and we parked Were, were you nervous? Were you nervous or were you excited or what was the- oh, A little bit apprehensive because we weren't sure what we were going to say, what, exactly what we were going to say if we suddenly confronted the chief justice, a person who was, as you recall, described as someone who fit the central casting model of a chief justice. He exuded dignity and authority in every aspect of his physical being. And there we were, we parked the car on a quiet street in Arlington. It was silent and it was late at night in the summertime and all you could hear were these insects that were be going up against the street lights and going Bzzz, and they would be burned. They were attracted to the street lights. They would be burned. It was that quiet you could hear that and the moths being attracted to the light of the street light. And you say, well, he really picked a nice place to live. And then it wasn't really on a street. It was uh -huh. up a driveway. You could see there was a house number and it was up a driveway. It had probably been the farmhouse once when Arlington had not been a suburb of Washington, but a, a farm community. And we walked up his driveway, a little bit uncertain about what we were doing with each step and where we were going. But at the top of this driveway, there was a nice, a beautiful house. It was probably built in the 19th century. It had a, a gable roof. It had a light up in the upstairs gable window. It had a uh, screen door. It was very quiet, except for the insects chirping, crickets chirp, 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 chirp. <laughs> I'm not a good imitator of insert. And so then, you know, you look around and say, what are we going to do? Almost the kind of thing you'd see in the movie, like suspense, where <laughs> what are these two reporters going to do next? And we went up, we rang the bell once. There was no <laughs> answer. So one of us grabbed the screen door <laughs> and shook it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and another light, another light came on in the upstairs. And in a couple of seconds, the door to this house and a dark driveway opened. And there was the Chief Justice of the United States in his bathrobe. Nobody sees the Chief Justice in his bathrobe. <laughs> it's the kind of thing that could leave you a little bit surprised and, and uncertain as to what you say. And the other fellow started to speak to him. And I thought I should intervene. And I said, what we needed to find out we needed to find out if the administration has been out here trying to get you to sign the injunction that would stop us from publishing and try and get the Supreme Court to stop you from publishing. And the first thing he did before saying what, before his growled greeting, when he heard, I thought we should quickly get to our business and show that we were there on, on business and not as a prank, he said something that is not written down anywhere because I didn't have my notebook out and I don't have the exact quote, but it wasn't as if it wasn't as if it was directly responsive to our question because we wanted to know if the administration had been out to his house. He said, I'm not going into town just to shut down a newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what a great line. <laughs> and and at his side, because it was so secluded, <laughs> he had some kind of revolver. And it, it just looked to me like a revolver. He's later said it was just a target pistol. But, you know, for people at the post who aren't, who aren't considered specialists in ballistics, it was good enough. Right. It was, yeah, it yeah. was good enough facsimile. Wow. That was that's that's such a great so story. Who, who, who is your, who is the reporter that you went with? Spencer Rich, a, poor, ah, a good Spencer fellow. Who, okay, yeah, sure. you may have known Spencer, a good guy mm -hmm. who had once worked at the old New York Herald Tribune, right? And had come to the Post after that. That's what my recollection. Uh -huh. And he had died a few years ago. Right. Wow, those are all 
great stories. Marty, I got to say, it's always great uh, talking. I, I, I always remember, I tell people, you and I were the ones who uh, had a double byline on Hunter Thompson's obituary. That was one of the great stories. I yeah. almost... I almost posted that on my Twitter feed the other yeah, day. I love that story. Came in yeah. Hunter Thompson, yeah. And I think that was we were the only paper. Stories. We were the only paper in the country that probably made the first edition. I that know. We before. made it. That was great. That was one of the great accomplishments of the Post. I agree yeah. with you. That was great. I always, and I always loved working with you. You were <laughs> great to work with. Yeah, I had yeah, a, lot so laughs, a, lot a lot of laughs. A lot of laughs. And I learned a lot. You're really one of a great writer, great editor, great reporter. So. Uh, well, thanks very much for uh, taking the time out. Uh, it's been great talking to you. And, I'm going to uh, tell you one more story. Yeah, yeah, only for it. You. For it. This is yeah. another terrific story. And, you know, sometimes there are stories that you can't write. And remember I said I planted the seeds of this story in the discussion oh, we yeah. had right. where we had the president's press secretary was scornful in dismissing this story to reporters who asked him about it. He said, they're making a lot about a third rate burglary. And that was Ron Ziegler. It was right, the president. Yeah. Press secretary. You remember the name. I remember him and saying that. Yeah. When Mrs. Graham died, we were on the newsroom. There was an obit was written and people were calling in and we were calling people to get comment from right and left. And then someone said to me, pick up uh, three. He said, pick up three. I had no idea who was going to be on there. And I picked up the phone and the gentleman said, this is Ron Ziegler. Oh, wow. Yeah. And he said, yeah, you know, those were the days. He didn't, this was only, this was a shorthand description of it. He said, those were the days. He was in a reminiscent mood. He said, here I am now sitting on my balcony of my high rise condo on the California coast, watching the sun set into the Pacific. You know, he said, what memories? And then he said, the boss always respected Catherine Graham. Wow. He said, he said she was a, he said, he would say, you know, Ron, she's a fighter. And he would, <laughs> he, he liked people who were fighters. Yeah, and yeah. I said, wow, I know, that's, this is great stuff. Yeah. And this is, is Ron Ziegler, isn't it? He wow. said, yep, I'm Ziegler. But there was no way to prove it, and there's nothing in print on ah. that great interview. Ah, but interesting. One of my favorite Watergate stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It That's was great. Him. That's great. But well, the whole really, idea yeah. of sitting I mean, on sitting on your balcony on your condo years yeah. later, watching the sun sink into the Pacific. Wow. That's a great story. I love it. A lot of great stories. I, I really uh, thank you so much for taking the time out. And uh, all right. And uh, as always, keep in touch, Martin. Uh, thanks again.